Okay, so thank you very much for uh, listening to this. This is going to be a, a little bit of inspiration taken using Darwinian principles. So I can get the mic right. Is that okay? Can you still hear me at the back? Okay. So, slime moulds to run the railways. Now, we're pretty much familiar with the ubiquitous rise of the network in the 20th century, and that would be railway networks, road networks, it could be power supplies, it could be things like the internet. So networks are absolutely everywhere. But these things tend to grow organically. So once they start, we don't really have any great oversight as to what is the best way of building the most effective, efficient, and resilient network. And of course, they go wrong. The most beautiful example is the baggage handling system at Terminal 5 was heralded as one of the greatest, most advanced baggage handling networks. Day one, it goes wrong. We have the blackout in New York State. So you can see the whole of New York State went out in 2003, a cascading power failure. And then we have, this could be uh, traffic around Carfax, but actually it's in South America. Uh, and you get gridlock in one of these junctions. So how do you make these networks, regulate them and control them so they, are, uh, they will function under an extraordinary wide range of different conditions? And this is where we'd cheat a little bit. So this is the sort of thing that would be very familiar to everybody in the UK. It comes to be from a couple of years ago. And it describes the woeful state of the British railways. And if you look at the last sentence, whatever the, the truth, this is an appalling way to run a railway. So it's a little bit of a joke, I suppose, in the UK, is what is the right way to set up the UK rail network? So we can take some inspiration from biology. And here we're going to try and pilfer some of Darwin's ideas. And we're going to suggest that maybe biological systems that build networks, because they've been subjected to all these rounds of selection pressure, whatever the compromised solutions they've come to might actually be useful. We might be able to learn something from those. So we introduced the slime mold. Now that, of course, is not the slime mold. That's Toshiyuki Nakagaki. So he's one of the people that initiated this field, if you like. This is the actual organism itself. And it's a single giant cell. It's like a great big amoeba. Strictly, it's not even a mold. But it looks like a mold in, in some senses. It lives in dark, damp areas in woodlands. But that is one single giant cell. They can grow in the lab to this sort of size. And if things, if conditions are nice and damp, it will go foraging for things it can find, bacteria, bits of fungi. You see it taking down a toadstool there. And you can find these all over the UK, in fact, all over the world. And they'll look like little sort of blobs on rotting wood. And the first bit of research that Toshi did that uh, I think captured the public imagination is you can take blobs of this slime mold and put them in a maze. They will grow together. They will fuse to make a single connected organism. You'll also see it pulsing away. And you can put food sources at the start at the end of the maze and give it a little bit of time, and it will find the shortest path through the maze. So that suggests that the system somehow is being optimized through rounds of selection to find or get shortest path solutions to problems. So there then followed a period where Toshi did lots of experiments, giving them rather abstract mathematical problems to solve, so traveling salesman type problems or solving geometric problems. But the challenge there is, are they actually providing a good solution, something that we could draw some inspiration from to the type of problem that we're familiar with? So this was, if you like, the second uh, phase of the uh, the investigation, give it a more complex problem. Now this happens to be the layout of cities around Tokyo. So Tokyo is in the center, the city's in little red dots, and that's the JR uh, rail network that connects them. So if we give the slime mold the same problem, can it solve something where we're already aware of the solution that human engineers have developed? So you'll see the slime mold growing. Now there's actually a little bit of a Darwinian principle in how it makes that network. It overproduces many, many uh, connections, and then you'll see them slowly thinning out. You'll also see little waves going through the system. Somehow it's working out what is the best set of connections to retain. And you'll see that it's not just the shortest path. There, is our, there are some additional connections in there. And the reason that's important is because if you have 
just the shortest path. It means that the network is very susceptible. Any break in it will disconnect part of the network. So you always need some alternative paths that means it increases the cost, but it makes the network very much more resilient. So that compromise that it produces with connecting all of those different cities, is that actually as good as the Tokyo Rail Network? So there are various ways that we can measure the performance. So this is a sort of rather busy graph, but the vertical axis, the y-axis, is a measure of the transport efficiency of the system. It's the minimum distance between cities. And the x-axis gives you a measure of the fault tolerance, how well connected is the system or tolerant to being a, a connection being removed, and over the total length, which is some measure of the cost. So that gives a sort of cost-benefit analysis. The real network, when you plot it out in these coordinates, is there, the green triangle. And of course, there is only one instance of that network. But with the slime mold, we can do lots of experiments. And if you look at the performance of the slime mold, they all cluster around the value for the real network. So rarely you'll get one which is exactly the same, but if you run many simulations or actual experiments on this, you get a cluster of points which are about as good as the real rail network. So that looks promising. It suggests that this system which is only operating with local rules. There's no great principle that it's trying to say, I'm going to construct a network that has got these useful properties of a good transport efficiency, a low cost, and a high resilience to, a resilience to attack. So can we extract some very simple rules that we can then put into some sort of mathematical model that would emulate that type of process? And the answer is yes. So this is a simulation of a very simple mathematical model that has a functional feedback between the flows on the network and whether the links are going to then strengthen or whether they're going to be reduced. So there's a competition, a survival of the fittest links that are tested by this functional assay for transport. And if you look at the performance of that network, rather nicely in a mathematical model, you can tune the parameters so you can weight up some of the coefficients, which will give you a network that is perhaps more resilient, uh, but, but will cost more, or you can tune them down a little bit. So that red line gives you a performance of how we can tune the network. But you'll notice there's some points that right on the far right-hand side where the model actually performs even better than the real rail network. So the same transport efficiency, but actually better resilience. So we can take the biological inspiration, recast it in a mathematical formulation, and then use that to design networks. But these networks don't have to have any overlying principle uh, that's guiding them, some, somebody with oversight that says, this is how we're going to build it. So that was Tokyo, which, of course, you might imagine, is a well-designed network. What happens to the UK? <laughs> and it turns out that the UK rail network was in fact the biggest network experiment on the planet, perhaps unwittingly. So this is how the rail network developed from the mid-1800s uh, going through into the 1960s where there was this very crucial event, the Beeching Report. And what Dr. Beeching did, he was tasked to do, was to try and make this network run more efficiently. You'll see the proliferation of all of those links made it a very costly network. So his task was to try and work out which of the links you really needed, you needed for your transport efficiency, and which ones you could get rid of because they were too costly. And so this would be the vision of the, the, the structure of the network in 1963, before the Beeching Report, and then a number of years after where it had been fully implemented, and you can see how that network has thinned out. Very much the same way as, in fact, the slime mold thins out its networks. Now, the only real difference is, in the whole of the Beeching analysis, which was a very thorough analysis, there was one word that you will not see in the analysis, and that's resilience. So at no point did he try and optimize the network for its resistance to failure. So you have a very efficient transport system when it's all working properly, but if you have a break in that network, it was not designed with that as an additional factor to try and make alternative pathways that you could use easily. So, if we look at the performance of that, in 1845, you'll see this is a graph which shows you how easy it is for that network to fall apart as you break various links. Now, in practice, in, in, an ex, uh, in silico, we can remove all of the links in the network. In a real-world situation, we'd be concentrating on just the bits on the far left-hand side, where you remove a few links. There's a breakdown in London, there's a delay in the northern line, something like that, where you, you lose a few of these links. 
As that network got bigger and better cross-linked, you see a massive increase in the resilience of that network. You've got to pull a lot of links out before you disconnect parts of the network, so the efficiency of the system remains pretty high. Post-beaching, you'll see the whole performance of the network drops back, and it eventually ends up at a level that is somewhere around the sort of the late 1800s in terms of its resilience. Much more efficient, far cheaper to run, but not as resilient. So, what would a slime mold do? Here's a map of the British Rail. We can do the same little trick. We can set up the major cities in the UK, let the slime mold go and do its stuff. It produces a network, and then we can compare the properties of that network and say, has it, <coughs> the compromises that have evolved in this slime mold, because in the real world, it is subject. It needs a short path. It's got to have efficient transport, but it has to be resilient because other things are coming along and eating it the whole time. So that is a compromised solution that it's found. And if we look at its performance, both for Tokyo and the UK, the overall transport efficiency, blue is the real rail network, red is the, the network formed by the Fizar. And you can see they're pretty close. It doesn't do quite as well as the real network, but it's not bad for a little amoeba. If we look at its resilience, again, the black line going down there shows you the real rail network. The red line shows you the performance of the Fizar. As you slowly break links, and the slightly interesting thing here is the Fizarum does perform better when you just remove a very few links right on the left-hand side of the graph. That's the consequence of it being slightly more resilient for removal of a few links in that network. There is always an alternative path, a relatively short alternative path. So, what can we learn from that bio-inspired network design? Do we actually want to build a railway based on a slime mode? Absolutely not. But what we can do is perhaps take those algorithms, that equations that describe how you would build useful networks, but apply it in different domains. And so that's the sort of thing that we're now trying to do. Uh, this is our sort of underlying assumption that the slime molds and fungi, another area I haven't talked about, they're grossly self-organized, planar spatial networks, they're home by evolution, and they may just give us some clues on what is the best way of doing this very complex trade-off between the cost, the efficiency, the resilience, and the control complexity. And they manage to do all of that without centralized control, which means any network you produce with those rules should be readily scalable. You can make it bigger and bigger and bigger. You don't have to do more and more complex calculations. It's the same calculation in every part of the network. So as I say, at the moment, we're trying to look at that in a range of different networks and just see whether this is a useful approach to looking at network design in different systems. Thank you very much. Thank you.